so uh, let me describe the uh, current uh, situation and uh, the, um, uh, my, the company I started and now has the record for a single junction uh, flat plate solar cells, which is 28.8%. Uh, uh, the record had been stuck around 25 for the longest time. So just in the past couple of years, it, it has been uh, boosted. The boost has come almost entirely from boosting the voltage. The way in which uh, Alta boosted the voltage was to help the photons get out. So it's very counterintuitive. Uh, that it, this, the new physics, let me describe what the new physics is. This is the picture of solar cells that existed until recently. The photons come in, the electrons and holes get collected, and that was good enough. Now, to break these records, it's a somewhat different physical picture. The photons come in. Yes, they create some electron hole pairs, but they most often recombine and produce light again. Uh, the light is infrared luminescence. It bounces around, gets absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, and so on. And finally, might get emitted. Now, when it gets emitted, that's actually good uh, because uh, the ability to emit uh, light is a hallmark of a very good solar cell. Of course, some of them do end up producing electron hole pairs which get collected. And uh, so the picture is of these two types of solar cells is very, very different. As you go above 25% efficiency, you've got to fill the solar cell. Even with one sun coming in, the solar cell fills up with 40, 50 suns of infrared luminescence. And that is a requirement for achieving the highest possible voltages and made it possible to break the record. And uh, this is essentially a statement uh, from Shockley is that, yes, you have your ideal voltage that you can hope for, but to the extent that you're incapable of emitting light, you give up voltage. So this is the external fluorescence yield, and it matters. Um, and you actually need a very high internal fluorescence yield because it, you need about 99% just to get 50% because it's going to bounce around so much and has many opportunities to be uh, absorbed and wasted and so forth. So you do need rather outstanding performance and it is rather difficult achieving 99% uh, internal luminescence yield just to get a good external luminescence yield. And this gives you some idea that the benefit, if this is 90%, most of the benefit is above 90%. So you need really good internal luminescence efficiency, really good internal reflectivity. 90% is not nearly enough. And as you get close to 100%, the benefit gets stronger and stronger. So you've really got to be close to 100% luminescence efficiency. So these, this is the performance parameters of the current uh, record-breaking cell. Fill factor is respectable, 86.5%. Could be higher, could be 89, so there's still some room. And um, the uh, voltage, this is an unheard of voltage, absolutely unheard of. In fact, when uh, the young uh, engineer scientist presented this at the photovoltaic meeting about 18 months ago, uh, people's jaws dropped and they couldn't quite believe it. And the question period was, um, Surely this was not gallium arsenide. Sure, it must have been a higher band gap material because the voltage was so high. So no, it's gallium arsenide. Next question. It says, well, your gallium arsenide is so thin it's a quantum well, and therefore it has a bigger band gap. It's not. No, it's, it's, it's a micron thick. So uh, they, you have to get used to this sort of new picture. This is the new picture of high efficiency solar cells. Uh, they have a lot of luminescence, and they tend to trap the luminescence internally. So you get a tremendous amount of internal luminescence. Um, now, it's very counterintuitive. You do need very high performance to get that. And uh, so let me say that for solar cells at 25% efficiency, don't worry about the electrons and holes anymore. Uh, they're fine. They're, they're, they're just doing fine. Anything above 25%, you should be concerned about photon management, preferentially. And the mantra for this is a good solar cell has to be a good LED. And the counterintuitive part, why would the solar cell perform best when it gives back photons? So it's, it's very uh, uh, counterintuitive because it, uh, it, you know, you'd think that uh, uh, maybe should hang on to those photons. Uh, and it's a little bit like society, is that uh, society often works best when you give back. So it's, it actually works for solar cells too. But it's a paradox. So why should I give anything back? I want to hang on to those photons and turn them into current. So I have here five slides. 
explain, I've, I have great difficulty explaining this paradox. So for that reason, I have five explanations. If I, if I had one good explanation, you'd get the one good explanation. So I'm going to try five explanations out on you. So uh, first thing is that uh, it's an indication that you have very little non-rative recombination. So if you have good external luminescence, it means uh, you have lost very few carriers to heat. The heat is total waste, so uh, it would definitely impair the solar cell. And so that's the first reason. To, to show that you have suppressed a non-rate of recombination. That's why you want to have good emission. Hmm. Okay, reason number two. Uh, well, uh, the um, external emission of photons is somewhat unavoidable. Uh, and when all the other losses are eliminated, uh, you'll do very well at emitting photons into free space. So it's a way of indicating uh, that uh, you have the highest possible efficiency because you've cut down every other loss mechanism and uh, you've now reduced it just to the ones that are going, coming back at you in free space. So that's another reason for the paradox. Uh, here's a third reason. Uh, the light comes in and uh, the, uh, a lot of the photons are trapped. Uh, they get reabsorbed, re-emitted, reabsorbed, re-emitted. And so uh, the reabsorbed photons are not lost. Uh, the, effectively, they recreate an electron hole pair. Therefore, the carrier lifetime increases. If you increase the carrier lifetime, the carrier density increases, and carrier density it goes into uh, the open circuit voltage. As I said at the beginning, a voltage or free energy goes as log of the density. So that's uh, some people like this explanation. Uh, reason number four is that they are reciprocal devices. I indicated this one already. So they're totally reciprocal. It's the same device. If you uh, optimize one, you optimize the other. You need a text drink to get light out in the, L in the LED. Therefore, it must also be good for the solar cell. And then we come to reason number five. This is my favorite reason. And it is a statement that luminescence is voltage. It's a tautology. To say that we want good luminescence is the same as to say that we have voltage. Let me show you some uh, formulas from the semiconductor world. Uh, luminescence is proportional to electrons and holes bumping into each other and emitting light. So they have to bump into each other. So it's the product of the densities. And there's a coefficient in front. Now, if you go a little bit about semiconductors, the NP product is actually proportional to the exponential of voltage. So from this viewpoint, having good voltage is the same as having good luminescence. I don't, there's no explanation needed. Luminescence is voltage. And in fact, if you had any doubt about that, in many manufacturing plants, they will actually put the solar panels out in the field and take a picture of the array with a camera. And they'll get some, some uh, luminescent, infrared luminescence uh, coming back, and the camera's going to see it. And the panels that don't emit, they say, those are the bad, those are the bad panels. Get them out of there. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a way of uh, doing testing in a manufacturing plant. And so this viewpoint is somewhat tautological that luminescence actually is good voltage. And, and that's, I think, the, the best explanation of all. Uh, so we want the good luminescence. There's a whole series of objections here, which I'm, I'm going to skip over because I think, oh, I, do I still have another few minutes? Oh, I have another few, okay. I can, so uh, I've given this talk, and a lot of people complain to me about this talk because uh, no one ever told them about luminescence. So uh, question, and I get in the question period, uh, my solar cell doesn't luminesce at all. And, and so uh, I have a confession to make. I'm not always very diplomatic. And so I gave him a flip answer, and I said, we should probably choose a different solar cell then. Okay, and and that, that was a flip answer. The, the, um, the, answer, the correct answer is, undoubtedly, you have a pretty low performing solar cell with low voltage, but there's always a very small luminescence present. So go back and check. Your solar cell does luminesce. Okay, here's another objection I get. Uh, and it's for the people from the, working on the organic solar cells. And uh, the, um, I say, look, if, if I, um, allow the electron hole to recombine, uh, then um, I'll get into trouble separating the electron hole. And I need to separate them very quickly. Uh, and so I need to have a big built-in electric field. 
and therefore I actually, luminescence is bad, I need to suppress the luminescence, they tell me. And my answer to that is that uh, it's really unfortunate that the ability in, in, in the organic solar cells, they have a very difficult time separating the electron and the whole pair. They need to have a big built-in voltage. This built-in voltage is voltage that they will never see again. And it would be, it's, it's just wasteful. It's kind of unfortunate. And I tell them, go back and try to improve the ability of the electrons and holes to move uh, uh, and be extracted from the organic uh, solar cell. And as the same group of people say, I, I absolutely have to suppress the fluorescence uh, because if I have uh, fluorescence, well, it's sort of the same, uh, same paradox. The suppressed fluorescence is an indication that voltage was sacrificed for current. Go back and work on your carrier extraction. So these are some of the objections I get. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, um, you, know, you, could, you can do very well. This is a, a tandem solar cell that uh, you can make with gallium arsenide. Uh, actually, I don't think I have the uh, slide here. Oh, I do have the slide. Uh, this is actually even out of date. This is now 30.8% efficiency in these Alta solar cells, but it was a dual junction rather than a single junction. Okay, so I pretty much told you the story uh, of the uh, how to get a good solar cell. What is the physics behind getting a good solar cell? I am very partial to these types of solar cells that are used in space. And uh, since I have your attention, uh, let me show you one of these very thin solar cells. Uh, let me show you first how they're made. Uh, they're made by floating the gallium arsenide film off a uh, substrate. So this is grown epitaxially. It's like the most fantastic, best semiconductor in the world. And, uh, but then you can come in with acid, and it selectively attacks, it's kind of weird stuff, it attacks aluminum arsenide, and it does not attack gallium arsenide. And so you can come in and you can float off the gallium arsenide and peel it. And this is an example of work from, uh, old work from Netherlands. They peeled it at, at this scale. This is two inch. And what I'd like to show you uh, what uh, Alta is doing, and they've reduced this more or less to an industrial scale process. And they're peeling six inch, which by some coincidence I have in my briefcase. So let me pull it on. So these are the peeled uh, gallium arsenide solar cells. And this is an example. This is along a six inch diagonal. So they're peeling it from a six inch wafer. And the, the film, once it's peeled, is actually surprisingly strong. And then the substrate you, is the expensive part. Then you reuse that in the uh, manufacturing plant. So there's actually a pilot plant in Santa Clara uh, that does this. And uh, surprisingly, like people who've spent their entire career working on 3.5 semiconductors, they fall out of their chair. I notice nobody's falling out of their chair, but you haven't committed as much as they have. They have truly committed to this material for, for decades, and yet they're shocked that the material is able to bend like this. It's very flexible. Uh, it's kind of, they, that they have not seen. And then you pattern into solar cells, looks like this, still completely uh, flexible. And uh, this is just the same thing. Uh, ready to put into a panel. So it's got the tabs on it. And, uh, uh, so they, this, is, this is how they make it. And these, this is the same cells that uh, broke the world record. Let's see what else I have here. I have other ways of peeling. So I, I've always believed in solar cells. The smart thing, because they can be very thin, the smart thing is to peel them. So there's a process, there's many processes out there now. For You can even peel silicon. So this is one of the methods. If you electroplate nickel on silicon and then uh, yank it up, the nickel sticks to the silicon. The silicon ends up cracking in a very reproducible crack. And in this way, peel off uh, films about 30 to 50 microns thick, which is good thickness for silicon. Uh, so that's, that's being done at IBM. This is being done at a small startup in, uh, in Austin, Texas, same, same idea. They, these guys call it exfoliation, and these guys call it spalling. Okay, a couple of weird names. Don't know if they'll stick. Okay, and this is another company has another yet another method of peeling the silicon. So I'm very, I think uh, peeling uh, leads to high performance and low cost. Uh, and this is the gallium arsenide device I just showed you. So I think that's the story. So uh, let me thank you for your attention and uh, 
go for questions. You have a question already? 